Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Dr. Val is going to be um, speaking on dental care, improved planning and treatment with VetCat Comb Beam C team. A couple of housekeeping, housekeeping notes before we begin. We will send you a recording of the webinar in a couple of days. Um, please submit any questions you have via the chat function highlighted below. Um, notice the orange button that was flashing earlier on. Once you click on that, you can send a question. Dr. Sarman is on the call as well with me. He is, he is our co-host and will answer questions he can. And of course, at breaks during the presentation, Dr. Val will also take questions. Whatever we can attend to during the webinar or presentation, we'll try to address at the end. And of course, we'll also take questions after the webinar is over. For those attending tonight, you will also receive a certificate for a one hour race CE credit, which will be sent to all attendees that are registered and on our call with us. Introducing our speaker for the evening, Dr. Patrick Val is not a customer service specialist, so I apologize for the typo there. He, he, he is a dentist. Uh, um, he is a veterinarian and he as a born and raised Buckeye and graduate of the Ohio State University. It's very important to him that I mentioned that he's from Ohio State and he spent the first 17 years of his career in general practice and emergency medicine. He became board certified in 2015 and became the owner of animal dental care and oral surgery in 2017. Dr. Val is a past president of the Colorado Springs Area Veterinary Society and current president of chapter seven of the Colorado Veterinary Medical Association. Dr. Val stays busy with his wife raising four children, one dog and one cat. They are now proud grandparents of their first grandchild, Guinevere, and he is very passionate about our animals and pets, being a vet and all things vet cat. So thank you, Dr. Val, for joining us tonight. Um, we've been looking forward to having you on and it's your webinar. So it's time for you to start sharing your screen. We'd love to meet you. Dr. Val on? Yes. All right. I think I'm unmuted now. <laughs> okay. Yes, we can right. hear can you see my screen okay? Yes, yes your screen shows well. Right. Wonderful. Well, welcome. I'm glad everyone can make it. I, I scrolled through the list a couple minutes ago of the people that had signed on and saw a lot of familiar faces and names. And, um, you know, I got to tell you that two, three months ago, I didn't have the first clue what Zoom was. I had never done a webinar before. I had sat in on some, but I, ne I certainly never taught one. And now this is uh, the fifth one that I'm doing. So um, I hope you're all safe. I hope you're doing well. We certainly live in a different world than we did two to three months ago. Uh, so I do hope everyone is safe and healthy and I'm really glad that you're all here tonight. So um, one of the things that's made it very different for me is uh, the VetCat unit that we got. We were up and running in February, beginning of February. And uh, so I'll, I'll talk about my experience with VetCat, uh, some of the things that we've seen take place as far as changes in our practice and the way we practice. Um, and, uh, and then I'll just spend some time going over cases and discussing some of the really compelling cases that we've had over the past few months that have just reaffirmed for me the decision to get this uh, really incredible diagnostic tool. So um, without further ado, let me see if, and you know what, I think I have, uh, give me just a minute. I believe I have two different presentations up and running. I'm not sure how this is happening. We have a beautiful picture of the baby right now, so it's all fine. Yes. I'll tell you about Guinevere in a second here. Okay, can you see my presentation, David? Yes. All right, so that's Guinevere. I'm gonna give you some brain breaks uh, during my presentation. I like to do that. And uh, so Guinevere is our first granddaughter. 
She was born on April 3rd. She has absolutely nothing to do with cone bean computed tomography, but uh, she is so stinking cute, I don't pass up a chance to uh, show people pictures of her. So when we do rounds in our, qu our clinic every morning, I have, uh, I just started it this week, but I have a Guinevere picture of the day. So I'll have a few of them during my presentation here for you guys. So, you know, I, I bought my clinic from Tony Woodward in 2017, and I knew that computed tomography was on the horizon. Uh, I knew that I wanted to get a unit. I had been reading about it, talking to different people that had one, and I knew that it was, it was definitely something that I wanted to pursue. I kept on saying that it was in my five to 10 year plan. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I think that was my way of just kind of putting it off a little bit. And then I had the opportunity to meet David in, um, in Orlando at the Veterinary Dental Forum last fall and got to see the unit, got to talk to him a lot got to talk to some other diplomates in our college that have been using the technology and just started to realize that I needed to not go with the five to 10 year plan. I needed to move on it right then and there. So uh, Dr. Guillory and I uh, spent a lot of time with Dr. David Sarment in Orlando. We talked to him about the unit, uh, got to see demonstrations of it, and uh, I've been nothing but impressed with Zoran and the unit itself, and I'll share a lot about that. Oops. Uh, so I'm very much a novice at cone beam computed tomography. I am not here as an expert by any stretch. Uh, I am learning daily as far as what I've experienced uh, with this technology. Uh, I will say that I have no disclosures to make. I'm not paid by Zoran, I'm not paid by anyone else but my corporation, Buckeye Veterinary Dentistry, doing business as animal dental care and oral surgery. So, um, but I was very, very honored when uh, Zoran approached me and asked me to do this webinar and just to share what I've experienced over the past uh, few months. So it really has changed my daily practice life immensely. Uh, not a day goes by, like if, if we don't use our cone beam on a patient, uh, my staff is a little bit disappointed. And it's, it's rare for us not to use it. Uh, so, and we're quite frankly using it on the vast majority of our patients. I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a bit about client compliance and how we're communicating with people about that. Uh, but it is a, a daily thing for us. The learning curve, I was intimidated by it at first. And there is a learning curve, there certainly is. It's not as bad as I thought. And I'm learning every day. I have resources available to me to help me with that, to help our residents as well. And so there is a curve, certainly, but it's not, uh, it's flattened, sorry for the pun, but it's not nearly as, as hard as I thought it would be. Um, one of the resources that I have available to me, if I feel the need, especially if it's something extra oral, um, whether it's an oncology case, a trauma case, what have you, if I do feel the need to uh, have a board certified veterinary radiologist do the interpretation. I'll use Dr. Cody Loss. He's um, a radiologist. He's based in Georgia. He used to be here in Colorado Springs with us, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. But some radiologists uh, kind of shy away from cone beam, uh, and I think it's more of a comfort level. They just simply don't feel comfortable reading it because they're not necessarily familiar with it. Um, I talked to Cody at length. He viewed our studies initially, said he was very comfortable with the quality. And so um, I would say probably about once a week, yeah, maybe every other week, we will send a case to him and get his interpretation on it and get a pretty detailed report. So I've grown very comfortable with that. Cody, uh, his website, he doesn't have a website for DVM Alliance, but um, his email is down there below. And um, if you're looking, if you do pursue this, if you're looking for a radiologist to help you, then uh, I couldn't recommend him more highly. So as far as the benefits of cone beam and over digital dental radiographs and what I've experienced, first and foremost, it is certainly a 3D image of a 3D object. The beauty of the Zorian unit is that it gives you multiple different views 
potentially all at the same time, depending on what you choose. Uh, so if you look at those images to the left, you'll see in the upper left, that's the coronal view. In the upper right, it's the axial view. Uh, below that is a panoramic view. And then to the left of that is the sagittal view. Um, and I'll show you what the, what the screen looks like with the unit in a minute as far as what, you, what your choices are and how you can uh, scroll through all these images. But it does give you multiple different planes to, to look at your images. It truly is multi-planar. Um, dental rads, quite frankly, are two-dimensional images of three-dimensional objects. And they're superimposed objects. And you're trying to decipher with shades of gray. So it is something where I still use dental x-rays. I don't see myself getting away from them. We're using them less, certainly less than what we did before. And I'll talk about how I've, I've done that and how we've worked that out more and more. And it's an evolution process in our clinic, but it is something where we use them significantly less than what we were before. And our comfort level with that is growing exponentially each day. So this is the typical screen that you're viewing with your uh, Zoran cone beam unit. You get the four different views, uh, coronal, sagittal, axial, and then in the lower right is the uh, 3D reconstruction. You can rotate that 360 every way that you possibly could. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, and then if you want to take away the skin basically and look at the bone reconstruction, you do have to go to a different screen. Uh, it's a couple clicks. I think the sign of a good Windows program is that there are multiple different ways to do the same task and you can do them in just a few clicks um, and, and get where you want to go in a short period of time. That 3D, 3D reconstruction um, step literally takes about 15 seconds. I know in, with the conventional CT unit that's in our building, uh, to get a 3D reconstruction was a little bit arduous to say the least. It was a process. And uh, the techs that we worked with from our medicine department would always shudder when I would ask for a 3D reconstruction. This unit literally gives me the same quality of a 3D in a matter of seconds. And it's been, I'm going to show you images of that, and it's been eye opening for me to be able to see that. Um, so, what you can do is you have these different uh, planes all on your screen at one time, or if you only want to use one. You can, you can have that full screen. The lines that you see going through, they're, co they're color coded and they're, they're based on each screen. So if you see in the upper left, that's the coronal view where I'm scrolling down through the coronal aspects. And if you see that green uh, line going through the center of that image, that's for the axial view right below. And so you can adjust that on the coronal screen and it'll change that position on the axial screen so you can see exactly where you're at in a totally different plane in one part of that anatomy. When I started using this unit I, I felt all turned around. Uh, I couldn't get my bearing and David was there for uh, two different uh, sessions with us when we had the unit installed and it just took me a day or two to really get comfortable with it. It was you know it, I won't say it's like riding a bike uh, but it was something that I got significantly more comfortable with uh, each day. And if I struggle with it, my, my two residents, Dr. Melissa Guillory and Dr. Devin Ringen, I usually call them over and they explain it to me and they show me a better way of, of moving through the images. But it is something, um, you know, David said when I first got the unit that he termed it elegant. And he said that it, it uh, was an elegant software program. And I didn't quite know what that meant at the time. And, and now I have to agree with them. It truly is an elegant program as far as moving through your images and making these interpretations. So as far as some of the other benefits that I've experienced, this does decrease your anesthesia time significantly if you're still not doing full mouth x-rays. Do I do full mouth x-rays with all my patients? now that I have cone beam. Uh, I don't. Some of them I do, but uh, they're getting less and less. It's not to minimize the, the value, the diet of uh, full mouth dental x-rays by any stretch, but as I'm getting more and more comfortable with the cone beam unit, I personally am not doing that. 
I do take targeted uh, dental x-rays of specific teeth if I have questions. I, I spoke with Chris Bannon at length right before I got the unit, and she said one, one view that, that she's always, um, I don't want to say struggled with, but one view that she's always wanted to see on x-rays as well is the mandibular incisor view. And uh, she just said she, she couldn't get a good plain view of those teeth all at once. And I see what she's saying. I, I agree with her. Um, you can see all those teeth all at once, but it's one portion of them as you move through the different planes. So that's, that's been an adjustment for me. Um, but if, if you had to ask me, what view do I find myself taking more frequently with dental x-rays? It still is the mandibular incisors, but I don't always do that. And I think more than anything, it's to see the uh, the level of bone and to see all those teeth at one time, depending on, on how many of them are left in so many of our patients. Um, so I, I do feel, and I firmly believe, that cone beam computed tomography gives you far greater detail than uh, digital dental x-rays. Uh, I've experienced that time and time again with the images that I've seen. Um, it also is the, the diagnostic tool of choice for imaging the TMJ. Um, and I'm going to show you at the end of my presentation some slides that Chris Bannon shared with me uh, from TMJ fracture cases that she saw. And I'll show you the, uh, the cone beam in different planes and the 3D reconstruction of TMJs. So there are some limitations to cone beam as far as what I've experienced. The field of view is, is large. You're looking at the entire uh, head and, and a portion of the neck. Um, so if you want to go and, and take an isolated image of one tooth, you can't do that right now. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm overstepping my bounds, but David did share with me that they're working on an upgrade uh, to, to have with the unit or future units as far as having uh, that more isolated field of view. Um, as far as soft tissue and use of a contrast, uh, it still is not, with what I've read, with what I've experienced, um, it's still not as good as conventional CT. Um, I have used contrast with my unit for oncology cases. We've sent those studies to Cody Loss, and he is comfortable reading our, our cone beam images with contrast, uh, but it's just, it is something where you're a little bit more limited. You can only see a portion of the neck. So if you're looking for, for metastatic disease in a patient, you obviously can't image uh, the entire cervical area with most of our patients for lymph nodes. You can't image the thorax um, uh, with most of our patients, obviously. So it is something that uh, it's a little bit more limited in that regard. That being said, um, I use conventional CT in our building much, much less frequently now because of this unit. It's, um, you know, we, we reach for conventional CT through our internal medicine group uh, when we are looking for metastatic disease in uh, the chest when we're dealing with uh, likely or, or already diagnosed malignancies. Um, so to take a full scan, a full cone beam scan compared to just taking one or two x-rays, it certainly takes longer, not by a ton. It takes, it takes my staff about four to five minutes uh, to do the scanning, to position the patient, to do the scan. It's really not that long, but it is something where for example, if I'm doing a root canal procedure, uh, if, you're, if you're a diplomat in the group here tonight and you're doing root canals, um, you know, when I, when I get my working length, when I wanna check the quality of my operation, when I wanna look at the quality of my final restoration, I'm gonna shoot dental x-rays for those images. It, you know, it takes uh, literally seconds. Uh, I'm not gonna scan my entire patient to get that one shot. I'm not gonna expose them to, to that amount of radiation just for, for what I can accomplish with a few isolated dental x-rays. So it is a situation where, um, that's why I feel like I'm, I'm not gonna completely get away from dental rats by any stretch. Also, if I'm doing an extraction and I, I wanna do my post-extraction image, I'm gonna do a quick dental x-ray. I'll have my staff do a quick dental x-ray and make sure that all the root material is gone. That being said, Cone beam is definitely, and I have a case example for you later on, cone beam is definitely more sensitive for showing uh, retained roots or retained root fragments. 
So um, there is a trade-off there, but I know that clinically when I'm moving through a patient, especially if it's one of the nightmare uh, grunge mouth cases that we see with periodontal disease and we're doing countless extractions, that is a situation where I'll probably shoot isolated dental x-rays for those sites. So uh, let's talk about the financial aspects and what I've experienced. It is kind of, for some people, it's kind of the elephant in the room, and it shouldn't be. It hasn't been for me since I got this unit. And I'll tell you, it, it was my biggest concern when um, we took the plunge of, of getting this device. Can I pay for it? Was it going to be cost effective? Not just, not just breaking even, but was it going to be profitable? It has to be profitable to make sense. So um, this is what I've experienced since about February 5th. Pricing wise, if we're doing a co-hat, uh, we don't require cone beam, but we offer it, strongly offer it, confidently offer it to all of our clients. And we'll charge an extra $295 per scan with our co-hat. If we're doing it apart from a co-hat, so say it's a trauma case, it's a fracture case, whatever, uh, anything apart from a cleaning procedure, then we're gonna charge $495 for that scan. Since February 5th, we've done 112 scans in my practice. Um, keep in mind that a lot of that time since then, we were in a very, very slow month for us during the Colorado stay at home order. We went down to four days a week from five. Our caseload was decreased from anywhere from three to six cases in a day down to more like consistently one to two. And we still kept using this unit for the cases that were coming into us that weren't routine, that we deemed essential. Um, we were still using this, this image. So the numbers that I'm showing you though, if, if COVID hadn't happened, wouldn't that have been wonderful? But if it hadn't taken place, I guarantee you it would have been far greater than what I'm gonna share with you here. So, this is the revenue that we've generated doing those 112 scans since that time, over 37, almost $38,000 in scan revenue alone um, after debt uh, since that time. Uh, so I've made three loan payments on the loan that I got. Uh, that's my after debt income, over 29, just over $29,000 in that time. Uh, my hospital manager, uh, roughly put together an estimate for me as far as what additional treatments has cone beam led to. And she, she gave a, a pretty educated estimate of $15,000. She's putting together a program. So that's, and that's over and above the $29,000 after debt. So that's over and above that figure. And she's putting together a program uh, that in our uh, EVET software, our practice software, that is gonna track all of our cone beam procedures and what was additional income that would have been, a gener that would have been generated only with cone beam um, compared to dental x-rays. So she's working on that right now. We'll probably have that up and running uh, within the next week or so and get our staff trained in using that just so that we can track this more thoroughly. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave that right there. It is something that, um, that was my biggest worry. Would it pay for itself? Would it be profitable? Would it be cost effective? And I don't mean to, to focus on that. Um, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic value in a second here, uh, but that has uh, calmed my, my fears as far as the cost of the unit tremendously. I'm not going to talk about the total cost. I'm not going to talk about my loan or anything along those lines, but it most certainly has been a profitable unit for us. And you got to love those colors. Look at those beautiful Ohio State scarlet and gray colors. And if you didn't notice on the previous slide, uh, Brutus the Buckeye. So we, let me just go ahead here. We named our unit Brutus and I put that sticker on there like the second day that I had it. So um, uh, anyways, uh, keep in mind your favorite colors if you take the plunge. So let's talk about uh, the cases that I've experienced and let's look at the big picture. So what's the other big question? Does it have diagnostic value where it's gonna change your treatment plan compared to dental x-rays? Um, so we all know that sometimes dental x-rays just simply don't tell the whole picture and that radiographs alone 
uh, sometimes quite frankly lie. If you look at that, uh, the meme to the side, uh, if you've seen The Princess Bride, it's one of the greatest movies ever. Um, that's where I always get the slide. Now I say that to some extent, dental x-rays do lie. They don't tell you the full picture. So let me put it this way as well with what I've experienced. If you do cone beam CT, you're gonna diagnose far more, not just intraoral pathology, and you will, I've experienced that. You're gonna to start to diagnose far more extraoral pathology, and I'm gonna share some cases with you as well. I say that, I believe that 100%. It's been my experience. You simply are gonna diagnose more pathology, and quite frankly, you realize what you've missed with dental x-rays alone. So uh, let's talk about some cases. Uh, any questions, David and Aramidi, do we have anything popping up yet? Uh, not, not yet. No questions yet. So everyone rem okay. remember you can always send questions and we'll ask them as needed. All right. So let's dive into some of the kind of meat and potatoes cases as far as what I've experienced. So this is Bailey. She was a 13 year old uh, female spade min pin. She had pretty advanced periodontal disease. Uh, she was one of those cases where I spent a, a decent portion of uh, my morning doing extractions on her. Um, we detected on the oral exam that she had a five millimeter pocket on the distal aspect of 309. So if you look at that x-ray, you can see it's pretty, uh, it's a noticeable infrabony pocket. There was a uh, definite uh, greater wall on the lingual aspect to that pocket than what you can appreciate because with x-rays quite frequently you're going to get some burn through in that area where you can't appreciate the full depth, the full uh, kind of cup capacity of that infrabony pocket. Um, so that by itself, we had a five millimeter pocket documented on x-rays. It's an indication for either closed root planing, maybe open root planing, depending on who you are and what measurements you go by. Uh, but either way, it's a pocket that needs to be treated. And typically, in the past, based on that x-ray, based on that oral exam, I would have treated that uh, with some type of root planing procedure. So you got to hold the horse a little bit because you look at that, you look at these uh, cone beam images. So the one on the left, you see right here, you can see the infrabony pocket, but we couldn't probe past that point. But you look at the image and you can see how there still is bone loss working its way down that back aspect of the root. What it looks like, and this is the sagittal section of 309. And there is some debris, still some dental tissue in there, but it migrated all the way down to the apex of that tooth. So it had become a perioendo tooth, not a five millimeter pocket by itself. It was far worse. If you look at the coronal view over here, you can see that that pocket wrapped its way around the buccal aspect as well. You couldn't appreciate that at all on that x-ray. It's pretty profound. This was the first week that we were using cone beam CT. So uh, if you go back to that x-ray, it simply does not show the full extent, the depth of that pocket. It went down farther. I mean, we know that with radiographs, you have to have, depending on what you read, anywhere from 30 to 60% cortical bone loss to show up on an x-ray. And that radiograph just simply didn't show the full extent of that pocket. We extracted that tooth. It was not a candidate for any type of uh, root planing procedure. So this is Buddy. He was a seven-year-old uh, miniature poodle mix. He presented for a cohat and due to a uh, uh, fractured 208 and he was, quote, missing 305 and 405, the mandibular first molars. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the difference between diagnosing dentigerous cysts uh, in a case like this and, and what you're going to see. So if you look at his x-rays, you look at 405 on the, on the right, and you can see a lucency surrounding that crown pretty consistent with a dentigerous cyst. Uh, if you look at the left, not nearly as obvious and you have to do a little bit of a double take. And I can see a lucency right here. And as it turns out, I believe that that was part of a, uh, the dentigerous cyst uh, on that x-ray. To make sure you can change your angles, see how that, that lucency moves in relationship to the crown of that tooth. And is it, is it associated with it? Is it not associated with it? But not nearly as obvious. 
and maybe easily missed. But with your cone beam, you look at the zoomed in image of this axial shot, and you can see an obvious lucency right there on 305, the same thing for 405. So you're not gonna miss a dentigerous cyst with this unit, with cone beam computed tomography. Uh, it's much more reliable. And I've had one dentigerous cyst case after another, just from dental x-rays over the years where I was extracting a, uh, an impacted tooth radiographically. I did not see a dentigerous cyst only to go in there surgically and find one. Uh, you're not gonna miss it with uh, CBCT. This is just a couple other views. This is the coronal shot. You can see a dentigerous cyst here and you can see how it wraps all the way around 405 as well. And this is just the zoomed in uh, image of that. So the other pathology with Bailey was uh, the fractured 208. And you can see here, so a couple things. There's an obvious periapical lucency right here consistent with an abscess. It was an uncomplicated crown fracture, but it was a slab fracture. And what you couldn't appreciate on dental x-rays with that, even though this lucency was visible on dental x-rays, but what you couldn't appreciate was the amount of bone loss that had taken place here on that buccal surface secondary to the crown fracture. This was Dexter, a uh, six-year-old male neutered lab, avid Frisbee dog. Um, the owners had adopted him uh, when he was about four. They did modify uh, his Frisbee play. They went to a soft Frisbee. They changed a lot of his chew toys, but he's a very mouthy, very mouth-driven dog. He lives to play fetch. He lives for his Frisbee, but he had done so to the point of where it was obvious on his oral exam that he had worn down his mandibular canines, 304 and 404, down to the point of pulp exposure. So they're infected, uh, dead, non-vital teeth. 204, the maxillary left canine tooth had abrasion, but without pulp exposure and without a near exposure. But then on the x-ray of that tooth, you look at that and you think, all right, is that a periapical lucency? Is that a chevron sign? It certainly doesn't halo out like many classic abscesses. Uh, it, it does taper with the shape of that root. It's a little bit irregular on that back part of it. It's a little bit of a head scratcher. It's a, it's a little bit of a maybe but then you look at the cone beam images of that tooth and it takes away all doubt. You can see the periapical lucency here over 204. Very, very obvious, very typical uh, for that lesion. Same thing here on the coronal view. This was the sagittal view, this is the coronal view, and we can see that uh, abscess in that area as well. So um, we actually treated that tooth with root canal therapy and um, the owners are modifying Dexter's play activity even more. So this is just another view. This is the axial view of that periapical abscess secondary to the chronic abrasion. Uh, and again, you look at that x-ray and you simply cannot appreciate how big of a, a lesion that is on your dental x-ray compared to CBCT. This is Gabe. So remember I was talking about retained tooth roots and how much more sensitive cone beam is yeah, for picking those lesions up. So Gabe was an 11 year old male neutered lab. Um, he presented uh, for a cohat and evaluation of his worn teeth. And um, 402 was mobile. Uh, there was a definite root fracture, which we could see uh, obviously on his dental x-rays, um, but we just weren't clear on the x-ray itself if there was a, a apical fragment still left in there. You look at that x-ray and, and perhaps it's right in this area, but it certainly does not jump out at you. You can see the abscess, you can see where the fracture uh, took place. You can uh, see that very noticeably on the coronal view of this area. But then you start going through your images and you can see very clearly a very defined root fragment right there as you scroll down through those coronal images through that part of the, uh, the mandible. Uh, here you can see the abscess, and we're just, and this is in the axial view as we're scanning back, and you can just see that root fragment start to show up in that area. So we went ahead and extracted it. You can see the post radiograph. Um, you know, you can make a greater case for the change that you see there that, that it was visible in the first one, but it would be easy to miss. And again, there's no doubt with the cone beam unit, 
uh, as far as the presence of that root fragment. It took a little while to get that out. It was still buried in bone and uh, definitely something we wanted to remove. Any questions about the cases so far? Uh, yes, a quick question. Uh, well, actually, a question that sort of refers to a few cases, and that is your um, clinical approach, now that you have the 3D view, uh, that probably applies to that last case, for instance. Um, do you surgically approach uh, the area differently now that you can see it ahead of time? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, um, I'm going to show some, some extra oral conditions where, as far as the 3D view, I, I definitely uh, have had that influence surgical approaches uh, for some trauma cases. Uh, intraorally, um, yeah, you know, I haven't thought about it that way, but uh, I rely on the cone beam as far as uh, driving that approach as far as what I do you know, with extraction therapy. Any other ones? Another question that you might be addressing um, later, and that is, at which point of time do you take the CT? Um, you know, you anesthetize the patient. Do you take the CT right there, or do you sometimes take a CT after you've started a procedure to see where you're at? Have you had this sort of experience yet? Sure, sure, good question. The way we do in our practice, the vast majority of the time, is and we have um, we usually have two tables going uh, depending on our schedule. Uh, we'll anesthetize the patient, do everything that we need to do to get them under, get them stable, and then we'll do our CT scan right off the bat. Uh, again, it takes about maybe five minutes to do that complete scan for a medium to large breed dog. We're gonna we're gonna scan it in two sections, so it takes slightly longer, uh, not by that much, maybe about a minute or so longer. So we'll do that. Um, and then while the doctor is scrolling through all the images, that's, the, that's the, one of the parts of the learning curve and a little bit of uh, time consumption during a procedure is getting faster and faster as far as moving through the different planes and looking at everything in your patient. Um, so the doctor will start doing the scan and then the, my staff will uh, start the cleaning, um, do the polishing. As soon as, as we're done with the scan, then we're going to sit down uh, with our magnification on and do the oral exam and start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And, if, uh, and while we're doing that, if staff hasn't finished the cleaning by that point, then they're going to continue with that. We put our treatment plan together and then we contact our owner and go over that with them. Uh, we pride ourselves on never doing anything without our, our client giving approval and knowing exactly what the treatment plan is going to cost them. So that's roughly the order uh, that we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. There's uh, two more questions, actually. Sure. Um, one of them um, uh, goes back to the financial presentation. Um, one question is if you can uh, uh, spell out, you, you said you were charging $295. Is it in addition? In addition to the dental x-rays, uh, and if so, what is the charge for the dental x-rays? Sure. So our dental x-rays with a co-hat, it's built into the total fee. And depending on um, uh, the patient, and it's, uh, it, it'll be, I'll just tell you, uh, it'll be either six ninety five dollars for um, a complete co-hat, including full mouth x-rays with the cleaning, and um, if we use isofluorine gas, 795 if we're using sevofluorine. And the cone beam is over and above that. Uh, we discount our dental, we discount everything down as far as our routine cohats uh, pretty significantly, at least 25%. Um, if we were doing full mouth x rays on a patient apart from a cohat, if it was a trauma case or what have you, uh, then it would be about $260 for those full mouth x-rays. Uh, but if we're doing a cone beam, in addition to a cohat, we're not discounting that cohat down. It's discounted down already. We're not going to do that uh, anymore beyond that point. Okay, thank you. There's um, yet another question here. Back to the clinic. Um, 
the the question is um, whether you decide to uh, remove those roots, do you go and chase those um, fractured uh, root remnants? Um, and um, do you do that systematically? And I suppose the question has to do with the combi. Now that you have it, have you started to think about leaving some root remnants uh, embedded in bone? Sure. Good question, and we get it frequently, especially in our, our wet lab classes. I used to go by, um, uh, what I went by was if a root fragment was encased in bone, had no signs of osteolysis, uh, the tissue over that fragment was calm, there, there are no signs of inflammation, no signs of draining tracts, then quite often I would leave that fragment uh, alone, document it, let the owner know that it's there and, uh, and not pursue it. Uh, I've, I think I've gotten much more aggressive going after those over the years. There is a, a study that came out in JVD recently. Um, uh, I, I think Kevin uh, Nee did it and, um, and he showed that there's more inflammation present than, uh, than what we've thought in the past. Uh, I haven't had a lot of cases as far as cone beam CT and making that difference, but I have had a few. I should have put them in this presentation. We had one a couple weeks ago where um, there was a root fragment in an older dog, and um, on the x-ray, there weren't any signs of lysis. There definitely was signs of lysis on the cone beam CT. So I've gotten much more aggressive where I would say the majority of the time now in our practice, we're going after those root fragments. Some people may not like to hear that, but I think we're just doing that based on experience and based on evidence as well. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and then we're going to get back to the sure. presentation. Um, one of the questions was for the non-vets online, um, what is cohat pricing? Sure. Um, comprehensive oral health and assessment treatment. Is that what they're asking what it stands for? That's Remedy? what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, we, we don't want to call those procedures just a dental. A dental can mean anything um, in this day and age. So we want to give it a name. And, and the goal with that is not to just give it a big, long acronym. And I didn't think of that. Uh, I, I'm not sure who, th who came up with that, but it's been around for a while. And um, uh, we want to call it something different than just a dental. We want to impart value for what we're doing. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's why we, we use that, that phrase, cohab. Yeah, uh, we do not call it just a dental. That can mean anything. The second question was, um, how would you describe the cone beam impact on your practice in terms of increased referrals and or customer or patient experience? Sure. Uh, as far as referrals, I can tell you the majority of our refer referrals so far have come from inside of our building. Uh, our medicine group for a period of time didn't have uh, their conventional CT, it was down and they replaced it with a new unit and they were actually bringing cases over to us, uh, especially rhinitis cases. And I have some examples of some of the collaboration that we do with the other uh, practices in our group. So I'll, I'll certainly go over that. Um, as far as client impact, let me backtrack a little bit. When we communicate um, with our clients as far as the value of cone beam CT, uh, and why we do it, why we advise it. We don't require it with our cohats. But what I tell people is, you know, we're doing cone beam CT now, and I explain the technology to them briefly. I talk to them about their own experience, perhaps in, in their dental chairs uh, when they go for treatment, and if they've had them. Uh, I saw one done on my daughter Rose. I watched two pulp caps be done on her, uh, and uh, the endodontist used cone beam uh, for that. Um, so I simply tell people that, uh, in my opinion, it gives us far greater detail and that it does shorten the anesthetic procedure. Um, and it's something where that's important to people. That means a lot to them, especially when we're dealing with, I mean, geez, we, we have 15, 17 year old dogs and cats come into us with heart disease, kidney disease, whatever, but they have these rotting infected mouths and they need to be treated and they need to go under anesthesia. And it certainly has decreased our anesthetic time for those patients. So when you communicate that to clients, uh, our experience has been like that, that slide said, I didn't mention it, but we have 
easily, probably like an 85 to 90 percent success uh, compliance rate uh, with clients accepting it in those situations. Quite frankly, if I have a trauma case, an oncology case come in, anything outside that standard cohat, we simply build it in to our treatment plan. And uh, we have not had clients turn that down. Uh, I can't think in that situation of a client not wanting a cone beam scan done in their pet. Thank you, Dr. Val. We will continue now. All right. So that's Maddie on the left there. Some of you know her. Uh, she was our pound rescue from Dumb Friends League up in Denver. And one of the things, I'll give you a brain break here. One of the things we experienced with the uh, Colorado stay at home order and just being home more, uh, we were out walking every day with her. And, uh, and, and that's just good for all of us. I'd encourage it, uh, depending on where you're at, and what you're experiencing right now as far as a shutdown and stay at home, uh, we're still allowed to get outside and walk our dogs if we're not in a heavily populated area. Uh, and it's something I would encourage you to do. It was really, really good for us during that time. So that's Elizabeth on the right. She's my middle daughter, uh, the definite athlete among us. And uh, she and Maddie and I have been walking hills uh, since, uh, we walked a lot anyways and we hiked frequently, but uh, that was just, uh, it's been a real, a uh, highlight of our day. And now, so Maddie loves COVID-19. Maddie loves uh, uh, the fact that we're home more, that she gets out for her walks and she's gotten to the point where she's quite demanding with us um, late afternoon, early evening, as far as getting out for her daily walks. So I'll share a case uh, about her in a second here. Um, first, this is, um, so this was Milo, 13 year old Labradoodle. And he was referred to us for uh, chronic progressive swelling on the right side of his face. And the referring, vet, referring veterinarian was rightly concerned about possibility of neoplasia. So um, with dental x-rays, that's 108. Uh, you can see a definite change in that bone pattern that I don't like, but I started to get a little bit more suspicious about the possibility of osteomyelitis with him. And I know in my experience, when I start to see these little punctate lucencies throughout bone, um, I start to get a little bit more uh, peaked about the possibility of osteomyelitis in a case like that. So a few other things that we found though uh, with this cone beam. So if you look at this uh, axial view over here on one, I'm sorry, on 109, you can see on the amnesial buccal root of uh, 109, there is a lucency there and you can't appreciate that over on the same root of 209. There were also resorptive changes uh, present on the buccal surface with a lot of bone loss over that surface. And then I could see a, a definite change in the bone pattern in this area and all of the soft tissue swelling that he was experiencing. But fortunately for, for Milo, I didn't see proliferation. I didn't see expansion. I didn't see any signs in this area of invasion, the obvious invasion, hold that thought, uh, into the nasal passages or anything along those lines. So, um, but if you look at the dental x-ray, here's the mesial buccal root, and some of those bone changes were present in that inner dental space, but if you look at that root, you can't appreciate uh, that lucency that I was noticing there. You certainly can't appreciate the, um, the resorptive lesions that we were seeing on that root itself. So I ended up extracting everything from 108 back to 110, um, did bone biopsies, and they came back as separative osteomyelitis, fortunately with no evidence of neoplasia. So um, that was my extraction site. Uh, I got quite large because the bone was just so abnormal in there. And uh, I know with osteomyelitis, I just get very aggressive as far as uh, bone removal and getting down to nice, fresh, uh, slightly bleeding bone and hopefully not seeing anything that's consistent with osteonecrosis where you see that green, yellow, putrid smelling bone in a site like that. He did have uh, a communication from that inflammation in that area right into the nasal passages uh, into that area. So, so that was something that I discovered at that extraction site. And that's that mesial buccal root of 109. You can see a nice uh, blob of granulation tissue over that root, just kind of confirming the abscess. And I need to plug in my battery here on my laptop. It's warning me that it's starting to go dead here. 
Okay, uh, so this is Lulu, nine-year-old uh, female spay dachshund with chronic left-sided nasal discharge. Uh, she had been partially responsive to countless antibiotics that had been prescribed by multiple different veterinarians. And so the discharge would start to clear up uh, and then come back. And what we found with her is that she had an oral nasal fistula, an ONF on 204. Um, it's not something that you're going to typically see on a dental x-ray. It didn't drastically change the, uh, the way I treated her case. These teeth needed to be extracted. Uh, you can see large infrabony pockets around both of these canines. But if you look at this uh, plane, you can see, and it, it doesn't show quite a uh, doesn't show up quite as well on the zoomed in image, but you can see this hole that was right there uh, in that alveolar bone um, on the palatal side. And, and that was just causing this constant nasal discharge. Uh, so she had bilateral dental disease, certainly, but it was uh, the, the nasal discharges on the left. So if you go all the way back to 208, it, um, you can see this palatal root uh, longer than I think than, than what you typically see, and you see how closely associated it is with the nasal passages and with the infraorbital canal, but the infection of that tooth had actually eaten through the floor of the infraorbital canal, and you can see some asymmetrical changes within the nasal passages in this area that you don't see on the other side where Lulu had previously had 108 extracted. Uh, so what I've realized is that you will see nasal changes frequently with cone beam CT, especially when you see this kind of dependent soft tissue fluid accumulation, very consistent with rhinitis that uh, often is secondary to dental disease. If you look over here in the sagittal view, you can see a nice pericolucency uh, over the distal root of that tooth. And that was actually uh, quite visible in dental x-rays as well, not surprisingly. So um, uh, lo and behold, we extracted 204, 208, and 209, and her nasal discharge resolved, and she's significantly better. So good outcome with, uh, with Lulu. Gracie, and here's a little bit of a soapbox case for me as well. So she's a, a seven-year-old American Staffordshire, uh, no previous dental procedures. However, she did have once a year for about five years before I saw her an anesthesia-free dentistry. And so she came in, she moved to Colorado, that was in California, where she was living. And a uh, referring veterinarian had noticed on physical exam that she had a left mandibular, rostral mandibular swelling. Uh, so sent it in to me, the fear was neoplasia, uh, as far as the swelling itself. Uh, they didn't anesthetize her and take x-rays, they just sent her straight to us. And that was the x-ray of that area. We did cone beam as well, but we also did an x-ray. And you can see an impacted, premolar, and signs very consistent with a very large dentigerous cyst that was involving the neighboring teeth and causing root resorption. If you look at the CT image, you can see how vast uh, this dentigerous cyst was. You can see the impacted tooth. Um, this is the axial view. Uh, this is the sagittal view. One of the things that you can appreciate far more with a um, cone beam image of a dentigerous cyst this big is how thin the, uh, the wall really is uh, of that, uh, that cyst. So you can see in that lingual aspect what she was dealing with here on that coronal view. And then this is the 3D reconstruction. You can see how it expanded out through the, the buccal cortical bone, uh, and that was the lesion that we were dealing with in that area. So one of the larger cysts that you'll typically see. Here's my soapbox. And here's the take home point for Gracie. She had these procedures, I don't even like calling them dental procedures, but AFDs once a year for five years before we saw her. And those were, she never had an anesthetic procedure uh, for a dental cleaning, certainly no dental x-rays before. And I'll just put it right out there. In my opinion, if a veterinarian, and I don't mean to demonize them or polarize the situation, but if a veterinarian is engaged in those procedures, I think they're guilty of malpractice. And this is a good example why. If she had had a dental cleaning done at any time prior to when I saw her, at the minimum, they would have diagnosed the impacted premolar teeth. Even if it hadn't formed, and I don't know how long it took for her to get to this point with a cyst that large, it didn't happen overnight. 
and it probably happened over years. So if she had had a dental procedure before, including dental x-rays, they would have at the minimum diagnosed those impacted teeth. They've always been there. They were there when she was a puppy. So uh, that's my soapbox for something like this, uh, that we always need to image our patients. Uh, even if you only have dental x-rays, they would have found those teeth. And again, I've gotten far more aggressive as far as removing those uh, in the majority of my patients when I diagnose them. I'll get off my soapbox now. So there's Maddie, uh, my own dog. And I had her in a couple months ago. David actually helped me interpreting her CT. And uh, she's the uh, greatest dog in the world. She just has uh, fallen right into ball family life. And uh, she's asleep on the couch in the other room right now. But what I noticed with her, she was due for her annual cleaning. And what I noticed with her is she was just a little bit more congested than normal. She was sneezing a little bit. Her snoring was a little bit louder. There is a definite change in the quality of her respirations. So I went ahead and did a cohat with her. And um, right away, as I was scrolling through her images, and this is a little bit hard to do with your own pet, but I saw an asymmetry in her nasal passages right in this area. And then I also saw this little density and had David sign on and he viewed the study with me and he's like, yeah, you're seeing something there. You're not making that up. Uh, this is a sagittal view. You can see that in, on the right side. Uh, and again, she had these little densities in there. So I talked to Brad Hines, one of our internists and uh, asked him what he would do. And he said, well, we, we should scope her. We should do rhinoscopy. So first thing is, and this was, this ended up being like two weeks later after this procedure, but um, first thing we did was repeat the cone beam and they're still there. Those soft tissue fluid changes were still there on the right side. And uh, so Brad did a uh, rhinoscopy and he could see uh, through the floor of that, that area um, some swelling and uh, didn't know quite what it was. Uh, went ahead and took biopsies, certainly some bleeding. Also hard to see take place with your own dog when she's under. Uh, and then we, we did nasal flushes, retropulsions, where we packed the back of her throat with laparotomy sponges. And there's a, a written technique for nasal retropulsion where you have to push, I think, like 60 mils of saline in five to 10 seconds. I forget the timing of it, but it's fast. And it's a lot of water. And uh, you push that through. And you're collecting everything with the laparotomy sponges in the back of the throat. You pull them out. And there are tissue samples there. You've actually flushed. Uh, tissue samples out. And, um, and so we picked through that, didn't find any foreign bodies, didn't find these little densities, and repeated the scan. And we could still see those densities there. Um, I have, this is the post-flush image. And you can see all the fluid within her passages, but these little, Cody Loss called them rhinoliths. I didn't know that there was such a thing uh, until I saw them on my own dog. Um, but that's what he called them. They were still there. I put her on antibiotics on clindamycin for about four weeks, and lo and behold, she got better. So I think that the flush, I don't know if it was the flush or the antibiotics, um, but either way, she got better, and that's Maddie recently out in the trails with us. Every now and then, she's a little stuffy. Every now and then, she, um, she'll sneeze, but it's definitely improved since we did that scan, and that was, um, uh, the flush was right at the end of, of March. So again, if you're doing cone beam, you're gonna find things outside of the oral cavity for sure. I'm very spoiled because I have other people in my building that can help me with things like that. Hopefully you won't find them in your dog, um, but pretty good outcome for Maddie. So I was very pleased with that. Uh, the biopsies came back from the rhinoscopy, basically a mild to moderate lymphoplasmacytic rhinitis. It, it had been there a while, longer than what I realized, but knock on wood, she's done very well and the congestion has not come back. So hopefully she'll stay that way. So a uh, few other extra oral cases. This is Pisa, it was actually, uh, she was actually a, uh, a cat that belonged to an employee of mine. Um, and uh, she's, she's a uh, seven-year-old female spade, Russian blue. She's got a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and managed very well with the tenolong. Chronic head tilt to the right, uh, that was undiagnosed as far as the cause. So she came into us for a routine cohat, and uh, Dr. Melissa Guillory was doing her procedure, and on her scan, she found this density uh, within the end of her uh, external ear canal, 
um, and it had basically ruptured through the eardrum. So um, again, I'm spoiled working at the Veterinary Specialty Center. We, we went and saw Dr. Campbell uh, a few hallways over, saw if she was available. She was uh, for a brief procedure. She rolled her otoscope over, uh, got down into Pisa's ears, and uh, found what we call a cerumen lip. Again, had no idea that those things existed, uh, but she found that uh, in her ear, uh, removed it. Somehow we lost the image of what it looked like. It was pretty disgusting. And um, she had always, always had underlying allergies as well. And so um, Brittany, our employee, followed up with Jackie Campbell, our dermatologist, and uh, got her on a hypoallergenic diet and her, di her allergies have improved significantly. So again, it's just a, um, a case of collaboration and the fact that you're gonna find other things. And certainly if you don't have someone like her available to you, I mean, you, you do have radiologists available that can, uh, can interpret your scans and find things like this as well. That's Guinevere. And uh, that's what we, we have to resort to right now. We're not allowed to see Guinevere. She's in Illinois. My son and daughter-in-law live there. And rightly so, they're very conservative as far as who she's exposed to with the crisis. And they have much more of a problem in Illinois than uh, even what we're experiencing here in Colorado. But it is something where we are dependent upon FaceTime uh, to see her. And uh, we probably FaceTime at least every other day, uh, get pictures daily. And for right now, that's what we have to go by. So uh, it is not fun being a first time grandparent during a pandemic, but it was my wife's, uh, Shannon's birthday yesterday. So we all FaceTime uh, with Guinevere. She joined us for birthday cake and candles and, uh, and uh, thank God for, for FaceTime and things like Zoom. So this is Julian, just a few uh, We have pieces. a quick question here. Sure, um, about Guinevere? Yes, uh, <laughs> it's quite a beautiful picture. Um, from Dr. Woodward, um, wondering Hi, Tony. If, you've modified, if you've modified any, any and or treatment intraoperatively using the unit. Um, intraoperatively. Um, with Gabe's case, we certainly did with that RTR. Um, we repeated the scan on him uh, intraop. Um, but uh, I haven't done that that much. I haven't done that many intraoperative scans after I've done the, the first one. Um, we have done a handful. I'll show you a few examples here in a second of postoperative scans as well, uh, Julian being one of them. But um, we haven't done that many. If I'm answering the question right, you know, do we do, it, do, we do our first scan and then an intraoperative scan? Um, not routinely. I haven't had a reason to do that very often. Those cases, like I was saying, as far as like endodontics or post extraction, we're gonna we're gonna grab a quick dental X-ray. Thank you. Okay, Julian. So this is one of our, our more intriguing cases that we saw. Fifteen year old domestic short hair cat, FIV positive, and he's going indoor outdoor. I know. Yeah, uh, we don't like that, and we talked to the owner about that as well. Uh, but he came back inside. Uh, with an unknown trauma and that very distinct firm swelling on the left side of his face. So we went ahead and of course did a cone beam on him. He was the 3D reconstruction that I had at the beginning of the presentation. And you can see that large bony protuberance. And this is what we saw with the CT. It gets better uh, as we go along through these images. But you can see here pretty significant fracture in the zygomatic process in that area with uh, little fragments. But this, this view, this coronal view, doesn't do it justice as far as what was going on with him. So if you look at the 3D reconstruction, and again, it takes a matter of seconds to have these images on your screen. Um, and then you can rotate these images 360, uh, ups, upside down, whatever you wanna do. Uh, you can manipulate them and, and view them in different planes. So you can see this very large fragment here, and then there are multiple other fragments coming off that area. This is not something, especially in a cat, that's gonna be able to be fixated and repaired. It, um, it, was, it was quite the comminuted fracture. So um, I made a, a small incision right over the, the protuberance and uh, pulled out multiple different fragments. It, um, almost missed one. 
And uh, I was able to go back to that original image and look at it in different planes and rotate it intraoperatively. So here's a, here's a case, Tony, where maybe I'm not doing another scan right then and there, but I'm certainly going back to uh, that 3D reconstruction. And I used it extensively with Julian and the next case that I'm gonna share as well. So um, I kept on zooming in, zooming out, counting the pieces as far as what was in there. And uh, I believe Dr. Guillory was helping me with that as well. And, um, and I almost missed one, almost didn't find it. It would have been somewhat heartbreaking to do a post-operative scan thinking that I had taken them all out to have left one. Uh, but that's what I had at the end of the procedure. And uh, this is the post-scan. So you can see that large deficit there. Um, I think he's, he's gonna do fine without that bone. Uh, we do need to worry about the coronoid process and that healing process, hopefully not getting scarred and having its uh, motion restricted. We saw him for a two week recheck. We haven't seen him since then, but he's doing quite well. Uh, so that'd be one post-operative complication I'd, I'd be a little bit worried about, but I really don't think that's, that's gonna happen with him. Uh, but this is a case where we certainly did a post-operative scan. This is Zoe, uh, very sweet, little eight-year-old uh, Shih Tzu and the victim of a big dog, little dog attack. Guess what? She had a left-sided uh, zygoma fracture uh, somewhat similar to Julian's. Uh, what we found with the cone beam that we really couldn't appreciate on dental x-rays was that the distal buccal root of her fracture of 209 was involved with the fracture site and that buccal bone was actually broken away from that site. And I did send that case to David and have him give me his interpretation on it. Uh, a finding that we also found unassociated with the fracture, with the trauma, was that 204 was non-vital. There was a slight asymmetry of the canal when I compared it to its contralateral neighbor, uh, but it was non-vital with a periapical lucency, and we found that with, with cone beam. Um, so this is the coronal view of that fracture, and you can see a very large segment. We tried to see if there was any possibility that we could reduce that, and we really couldn't. There was no fixing that. It was, uh, that looks like a big piece of bone right there. It was actually somewhat small. Um, so Melissa Guillory actually did the surgery and, and I assisted her with it and we were able to remove that, that fragment. You can see some pockets of air uh, from the bite wound. And uh, this is the axial view of the area of 209. And you can see it's, it's, the, it's the distal aspect of 209 uh, as we were scrolling back and forth. And what we could see was that the overlying bone in that area had broken away. And that's that big fracture segment of the, um, uh, that would be the, the zygomatic process of the frontal bone uh, that had broken away. So 209 needed to be extracted as well. There was no uh, oral cavity exposure though. It was not an open fracture in that area. It did not penetrate down into the oral cavity. So um, it, it was something that, uh, that we went back and extracted that tooth. We actually did it two weeks later when we did the root canal on 204 which had that periapical lucency that we saw with uh, the sagittal view. Uh, and then this is just the 3D reconstruction of um, Zoe's fracture. And you can see that very large segment of bone right there, and then a bunch of other uh, comminuted fragments. Uh, but the mandible otherwise was fine. It, um, could have been far worse for Zoe. It's just another view. You can see that segment again in all the different fragments. This is the post view and there's one tiny little, this bug Melissa, but there's one tiny little fragment there. I think she's gonna be fine with that, uh, but that's the post-operative view. Okay. Any questions up to this point? We just have a few more slides and then we can really open it up if people like. Um, no additional questions right now. Okay, so I have not yet had a, um, a temporal mandibular joint fracture. Uh, with the uh, cone beam that I've been able to diagnose. Uh, we just haven't had one yet. I'm sure they're going to come and we'll be able to find them. But uh, this is, as David uh, may say, a very elegant unit for evaluating the, the TMJs. Uh, so Chris Bannon uh, was kind enough to share a few images with me. And uh, David helped us with the 3D reconstructions as well. But if you look at that image on the left, that axial image of the TMJs, you can see that bone fragment. Um, 
uh, right on that aspect right there. And then when you look at the um, uh, the 3D reconstruction, you can see this as well. And this patient was dealing with a pretty large caudal mandibular fracture. Uh, so I'll say a couple words about that. You know, you with dental X-rays and quite often with skull X-rays, you just simply can't diagnose caudal mandibular fractures the way we would like to. Uh, it's very difficult, very challenging, and quite often you miss uh, the fractures. Um, and we see cats all the time with caudal mandibular fractures, and you're simply not going to be able to image that area with a number two size sensor uh, digital x-ray. Uh, so um, we're, we've only had a few, you know, fractures come in groups. We can have like three fractures next week, but we haven't had a lot over the past few months. Uh, but uh, when they come, uh, we're prepared with, with the cone beam as far as imaging them. Um, I think that will adjust our treatment plans. Uh, we'll definitely do post scans afterwards to evaluate our fixation, depending on what technique we use. Uh, so this is another case from Chris, and you can see a pretty involved uh, fracture of the TMJ joint. It's comminuted, and uh, this poor cat had a very significant caudal mandibular fracture in addition to what was going on with the TMJ and um, uh, symphyseal separation as well. So a lot of trauma to this cat, and you can see it very, very easily. You can see the full extent of it with the 3D reconstruction. I didn't ask Chris, I haven't had the opportunity. She said she wasn't gonna be able to make it tonight, but she was gonna watch the recording of the webinar. So she needs to share with me what exactly she did with this case and uh, how she fixed it. But um, it is something where the 3D, I know it's gonna be invaluable for us as far as evaluating cases like this. Okay. What questions? Anything that I can answer at all? Thank you, Dr. Val. This was a fantastic presentation. You've covered so much. Um, it's very impressive to see how much you've done in a short period of time in, uh, and in, um, like you said, in, in a condition that uh, is very unique, a time, of, uh, a time for all of us that's very unique. So you, um, you've covered quite a bit of Thank you. Different uses of this unit, and um, and uh, uh, it looks like it's really enhanced your diagnosis, treatment plan, surgical approach uh, already in, uh, in, in very quickly, and uh, it's it's quite a quite interesting. Um, I think we can open the the microphone to everyone. Um, oh, here's a question here. <laughs> uh, well, I think we all know the answer to this one. Uh, this is from Dr. Guillory asking, which college will uh, Guinevere go to? <laughs> which college will what? Which college will your granddaughter go Guinevere. to? Guinevere. Yes, Guinevere. <laughs> you know, I, I know the answer may seem like the Ohio State University, but um, I would prefer she be closer to Colorado. So, um, you know, like Colorado College is about 10 miles south. Uh, Colorado um, uh, State, uh, they have their Colorado Springs branch, that's here as well. So I am all for that. I think Guinevere should get her residency in Colorado and get in-state tuition for her parents. And um, if she comes to Colorado, I'll be happy to contribute to that fund as well. Good question. Yes, that is a good question. <laughs> Dr. Woodward would like to know, and he wants an honest answer to this question. If Colorado State were to play Ohio State in football, don't you think <laughs> Colorado State would win? No, no. <laughs> an honest answer? <laughs> no. We played CU a number of years ago. That wasn't pretty for CU. Yeah, um, so, yeah. I think Colorado State's... Uh, typical goals for each season is that maybe they'll be 500 and get to go to like the Midas Bowl or something like that. I don't know. Something like that, but let me tell you, it's not always possible. Some tympanums are so angular that no matter what the heck you do, you're not going to get there. So then I find some, you know, more open space. And that's what they do for the tympanic, uh, you know, when they put the tympanic cubes. This is Dr. Qureshi, okay. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. They just so, make it. I opened the microphone to everyone, so he might be. Um, uh, Dr. Qureshi has done a, a lot of ear imaging. I would happily hire you. 
any time for Bear Creek. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, Pat. Yes. Hey, it's Barden. Um, when Chris, how you doing? When Chris, um, Chris was showing some slides, you talked about maxillary uh, uh, molars, and of course, you know the one you showed. She said that she's working on, you know, maybe getting a catalog of images where she found that clinically that that radiography just didn't cut it on a lot of those teeth, and and you know, it's some of them are easily defined and especially the, some of these small breed dogs where maybe you know you think is it is it because he's chewing he's got a wider pdl do you find that you're diagnosing more more of those you know cheek teeth pathologies than you did before i know it's early in the game and then also she showed some images which are kind of cool of the uh powder root of the fourth upper actually being in the uh, in the canal and it gave her a false sense that there was an apical lucency didn't know if you've seen those as well that kind of fool you mm -hmm. um she she felt like there was a a lucency on cone beam or on on, on combi. No, no, no. It just, it just had, it, it, it was just a lucency, but it was in the canal. It wasn't pathologic. It was just sure. an anomaly, which yeah. is pretty cool. I, I haven't seen that yet. A uh, few things, as far as the upper fourth goes, um, what I have, a, I feel like I appreciated it before. I have a really, really good, healthy respect now for the palatal root of the upper fourth premolar, as far as its proximity to the infraorbital canal and the nasal passages. Uh, it's right there with a, with a paper thin layer of bone. So um, I've noticed that far more. Um, as far as the maxillary molars, I agree. Um, I've diagnosed, I, you know, I can't say it's been a lot, but I certainly have diagnosed more periapical lucencies, particularly on the palatal root. And again, the beauty of this unit is you can be scrolling through with that tooth, I would say the axial view more than anything is really going to show you the uh, the palatal root of the first and second maxillary molars. Another thing that I've noticed, um, you know, I always knew that we had ribbon canals where, Wait, I'm so sorry you know, quite frequently way. the the distal buckal root is fused as one with the palatal root of your second maxillary molar, ah. I would say that's Well, present. I was actually just in the middle of this um, webinar and I was going to share it with you in face hey, David, I think we might want to just mute a, them temporarily. A very uh, dentist out of um, so, Colorado, but, um, Springs, Colorado, and he was just giving us anyways, uh, a presentation. Um, there we go. So I've appreciated far more ribbon canals on the second maxillary molar than I ever did before. I would say that that tooth has a ribbon canal far more frequently than it doesn't. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. It seems like um, it's a study to be done. Um, that palatal root hasn't, you know, systematically, it would be interesting to see. Sure. A, a series it's a really of good study for a resident. Yes, a resident study. Very good. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been um, a wonderful evening with you. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to share your, your early experience. Um, I think we had um, just a great, uh, now a better appreciation of what you've gone through and how the, um, this new dimension has helped you. So I appreciate very much uh, the time you've taken to put this presentation together and to share it with us. Uh, and um, thank you again for sharing the pictures of your granddaughter. She's just beautiful. And uh, she is. Uh, some of us are not that far from her, so we may get to, we may get to visit somehow. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Pat, thanks Have so you... much for taking the time tonight. Appreciate it. Jim well, Merrick. Thank you, everyone. So thank, thank you, everyone. Patrick. It was great. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for joining us. Good job. Go box. Go Bucks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye, Dr. Val, thank you. Night. Thank you.